say, 20 or 30 years ago, I felt one set of standards should serve every company. But as we started looking at the needs of small companies, the IASB concluded the users of the financial statements of small companies have very different needs for information than investors and creditors in big listed companies. Uh, we embarked on this standard in uh, about 2004 and finished the standard in 2009, July. I forgot to bring a copy with me. You can see on the slide uh, on the screen what it looks like, that orange color. It's this size. If you have seen, full, and I mean this thick, very thin. If you've seen full IFRS, you know it's what 3,800 pages. It's a big, two books, in fact, about this big. We have developed a standard that's very small, and as I will tell you this evening, is widely used now just four years or five years after it was issued. Um, I forgot to ask, how do I change the slides? <laughs> I see, is there a remote control <laughs> to change the slides? Hmm. Um, the goal of the IASB, I believe everyone has a copy of the slides. Would you, would you, do you want me to stand up there and speak? Oh, I, I can stand there, it's fine. But I need to bring my water with me. Thanks. OK. This slide sets out what is actually in our constitution as our mission, to provide the world's integrating capital markets with a common language for financial reporting. But our Constitution goes on and says, in fulfilling that objective, the IASB must address the special needs of small companies. We are very proud that today, really just 13 or 14 years after the IASB took over the standard setting for the, for the world, we have well over 100 uh, countries, roughly 120 countries, require or permit full IFRS for all uh, or, or nearly all of their domestic listed companies. That is a huge adoption around the world. For the SME standard, which only was issued, as I said, in July of 2009, we already have 80 countries adopted. Now, for most of my career, I was an accounting technical guy. I worked in the technical, I worked for the US FASB, I worked for IASB, I wrote accounting standards. But since 2009, I've become a marketing guy. And I'm selling the IFRS for SMEs because I believe in it. Well, every good marketing guy needs a slogan, a marketing slogan. And mine is what you see here on this uh, first line, good financial reporting made simple. And that is really what the IFRS for SMEs is all about. It's only 230 pages long instead of the nearly 4,000 for full IFRS. But it is built on an IFRS foundation. I can tell you literally that how, I wrote every word of it, how I started was to take the Microsoft Word files of full IFRS, reorganize it by topic rather than chronological when it was issued, pull out the fundamental principles, and go over with our board one by one whether we should simplify and if so, how and whether the principle was even relevant for a little company. So it is based on IFRS. It is not stand alone. I'm happy here. 
Um, so who is eligible to use the SME standard? When the IASB debated that question, people said, oh, you need to develop quantified criteria. Who is an SME? The IASB said, we cannot do that for the whole world because a company that might be in numbers small in a small country, uh, I mean big in a small country, might be small in a larger country. So we developed a principle. We said if your company has public accountability, you should be using full IFRS. And you have public accountability if you're listed or if you are a financial institution like a bank and you're preparing general purpose financial statements. If you do not have, if you're not listed and you are not a bank or insurance company, as far as IASB is concerned, you are eligible to use the IFRS for SMEs. We've aimed the standard at companies that produce general purpose financial statements. But which companies are required to do that is up to the local jurisdiction. Remember, IASB is not a government agency. We don't have the power to tell one company in this world, you must use our standards. Each country, usually the legislature, the parliament, uh, sometimes a regulator or some other branch of government in the, decides what is the public interest in ha having full IFRS information and what is the public interest in having SME information and what is the public interest in uh, which company should even be required to publish financial statements in the first place. You, uh, some of you can tell from my accent I'm American. And in the United States, there are over 25 million companies. But of that 25 million, by law, only about 25,000, a tiny percentage, is even required to prepare financial statements. All of the other 24.9 million may publish financial statements if they wish. The banks may force them, some banks will force them to do that, uh, to get an audit if you want a loan. But the law simply says listed SEC companies and a few others must publish financial statements. In contrast, uh, I, and I'm, I live in Hong Kong and have for many years, we have over 900,000 companies registered with the company's registry in Hong Kong. Every single one of them, by law, must prepare general purpose financial statements and have an audit. It's, we have more companies in Hong Kong by far publishing their financial statements than in the whole United States. So each country has to decide what is the public interest in this information. But let me give you some numbers that, that may surprise you. If you look at the World Federation of Exchanges, which is the association of stock exchanges in the larger countries around the world, they've got 52 stock exchanges. Together, they only have 45,000 listed companies. Europe has 25 million SMEs. The United States, that number I think is low here, it's closer to 25 million. United Kingdom, 5 million. Brazil, 5 million, and on and on. So the numbers of SMEs compared to listed companies is staggering. It's, it's virtually all companies are SMEs. So the IASB issued the standard four years ago it is a standalone document. A company that uses it is never ever required to go and look in full IFRS. 
The answers are in this little book. I mentioned earlier that we found the needs of the users of small company financial statements are quite different from big companies. An investor in a listed company wants to be able to forecast earnings, forecast stock prices, look quite long term into the future. For SMEs, mainly the user is a creditor, either a lender who wants to know short term, if I lend money to this company, what are my prospects of getting a return on my money and my principal when it is due? Or if I'm a creditor and I extend credit to this little company for 30 or 60 or 90 days, when I send my invoice, what are my chances of getting paid? It's a different group of users with different information needs, shorter term information needs, than public capital market equity investors. So I've mentioned the standard is much smaller than full IFRS. It is organized by topic, not by chronology, which is how IFRS happened to be numbered. And there are many simplifications. There's actually five kinds of simplifications. Oops, let me move this up. Number one, some topics are simply omitted from the SME standard because little companies won't encounter them very often. I'll give you a few examples. Segment reporting, line of business and geography. Um, an, another one uh, would be um, earnings per share. Uh, and so on. These are issues that our board identified as relevant for big listed companies, but not for the little ones. Secondly, where full IFRS have accounting policy options, we have put in the SME standard the simpler option. The biggest debate our board had was number three here, recognition and measurement simplifications. And that means simplifications in how do I, which assets and liabilities and income expense do I recognize as an SME and how do I measure it? And we did make some important changes for little companies as compared to what full IFRS requires for the big companies. Reduced disclosures, dramatically reduced disclosures. My next slide has some numbers. And simplified drafting. All of the larger international audit firms publish big fat books of audit checklists for IFRS and they have disclosure checklists. So I took one of them, one of the big accounting firm disclosure checklists for IFRS, and I counted the number of disclosures they have in their book. It's over 3,000. We published with the IFRS for SMEs, right in our standard, a disclosure checklist for the SME standard. So you can go count how many disclosures we require, it's 300. That's a 90% reduction. We kept any disclosure that is relevant to assessing short-term cash flows, liquidity, and solvency, but we dropped things that are disaggregation, that mean, like segment reporting, where you break down the total company numbers into smaller groups, and we eliminated a lot of disclosures that really are relevant for public capital markets. Now, I, I can tell you that one of the benefits of writing this standard for me was I ended up going to well over 60 countries to talk about the standard. Training programs, uh, convincing them to adopt. 
in every one of those countries, I talked with little companies or standard setters, accounting standard setters, and I talked to bank lenders. The little companies and their auditors said, our biggest problem is we are a successful company. People are buying our product. We want to grow. We need capital. I go to the bank and they won't lend to us. Or they lend to us at a very high rate of interest. And when you go to the banks, at the same trip I went to talk to the banks, you know what they said? It was very simple. We don't trust the numbers. If we had good information, we would lend. Or the price that the little company will pay would be reduced because we don't have the, what the economists call information risk. The risk that the financial numbers really aren't correct. So capital, access to capital, is the number one concern of little companies, and that's our number one goal in writing this standard, was to help little companies get better and less costly access to capital. Now, improved comparability is also important. You can see that for public capital markets, for full IFRS, where you can buy shares of stock by turning on your computer, and you can buy shares listed in Paris or London or New York or Hong Kong. And so you really need to compare, but it's the same for little companies. They can go wherever they can go to get capital at the cheapest rate, and those who provide capital want to compare. Look at Europe. Europe is now... 31 countries, the EU and EEA, and the old name for Europe was the common market. The point is that business crosses the borders, and we need to be able to compare information for small companies as well as for big, because the little companies might be borrowing money across borders just as easily as borrowing locally. Improved quality of reporting compared to national gaps. A good number of countries have developed their own SME accounting. But quite honestly, a lot of those left something to be desired. When I talked to those bankers and you said, what information is important to you? They said, the most important financial statement I get is the cash flow statement. Because I want to know if I make a loan, will they have cash coming in to pay me? But you look at most of those national SME standards, they didn't require a cash flow statement. Uh, so I think we've improved the quality. And on the reverse side, there are quite a few jurisdictions that adopted IF, full IFRS as their national gap. Hong Kong was one. And to this day, the national gap in Hong Kong, we're not a nation, but the, the local gap is IFRS. And until just a few years ago, that was required of all of those 900,000 companies. And let me tell you, if I buy a condominium apartment in Hong Kong, one apartment, and I put it in a corporation, the law says I have to prepare financial statements and have them audited and publish them. And believe me, if I did that and I go to look at full IFRS 4,000 pages, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. So I think it's fair to say that, and, and Hong Kong has adopted the IFRS for SMEs, by the way, um, but I think uh, the SME standard is less of a burden by far for those jurisdictions where they have um, adopted full IFRS as their national gap. I've made a whole list of other benefits here. You, you can read them. I mean, uh, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Let me just, I want to move on to, to show you what's actually in the standard. 
and, and we will be done by eight o'clock. I promised Asif that. Um, we've got over 80 countries have adopted. I've got slides 15, 16, and 17 is a list of those countries. I'm not gonna read you the list, but I'm very happy, needless to say, that we've got so many, and, and also quite a few others debating, one of which is Saudi Arabia. But you can see all over the world, virtually every country in South America, Central America, and the Caribbean has adopted. Uh, Asia, some. Uh, in, in any event, we've got a lot of adoptions. The audit report says something like, in conformity with the IFRS for SMEs. The IASB generally, when it issues a standard, says, we, know, we don't say this, but the, the, we don't do much. We say goodbye and good luck. You know, we've issued the standard. It's up to each jurisdiction to do their own training and uh, implementation. But we knew that for the IFRS for SMEs, we have a whole new constituency. Millions of these little companies that had no idea what IFRS is, who IASB is, they've now got a new simple standard. They need training, they need translations, they need uh, help in applying. Let me give you some examples of what we've done. We've translated that standard already into many languages. Here's a list, Arabic included. We have others currently in process. We, have, we ran something that we've never done before, three-day intensive training workshops. I participated in virtually every one of these. They're anywhere from 40 people to 100 people, uh, except in Brazil, it ended up to be 7,000. They, they put it on television and so on. But 40 to 100 wor uh, people in a three-day workshop with a clearly defined curriculum, two teachers, all free. We don't charge for this except just pay our airfare to get wherever you, you want us to do this. The slides that we use for this training are all available on our website in six languages, you can see here, including Arabic. You can do your own training on the IFRS for SMEs. Take our 1,100 slides and the institute can do their training. We encourage you to take our slides. We in appointed an implementation group. We knew that as soon as we issued that standard, there would be questions arising. Not too many, but some about who is really eligible to use the standard, uh, and, and a few questions on the technical issues. This committee called the SME Implementation Group, made up of, it's now well over 40 people from all over the world, they meet by uh, uh, internet. Uh, we have, they held one face-to-face -face meeting in four years now. And they make recommendations to the IASB on changes to the standard, and they develop questions and answers on application issues. We've only issued seven Q&As. On slide 23, there's a list of them. I, I won't read you the list. You can download the Q&As for free from our website. Oh, I forgot to mention. I gave you that list of all of those translations. They're all available for free on our website. So the 230-page standard is available in all of those languages, just download. Training materials. Those slides I mentioned, the PowerPoints, are for uh, training sessions, live training sessions with a group of people. We developed training material for self-study. You can download these, one module of our training for each of the 35 sections of the IFRS for SMEs. It's available in English and Spanish and several other languages. I, uh, to be honest, I don't remember whether the training material is yet available in Arabic. Uh, it's about 2,000 pages, but it's 
mostly examples. How do I calculate this? What's the journal entry for this? There's some case studies. At the end of each module, there's a quiz with answers. There's a, a page or two, what are the differences with full IFRS? And a page, what are the significant judgments and estimates you will have to make in applying that section? All of these materials are available for free download, self-study. We have a newsletter. Uh, I'm already a little behind on this slide. We're up to 17,000 subscribers. I just checked with our IT people the other day. Every month, we have a newsletter with all sorts of news about the IFRS for SMEs, new adoptions, new Q&As, uh, new training materials issued. If we're going to do some training courses, that kind of thing. You can subscribe for free. It will come in email then every month. We've got a little executive briefing book for non-accountants aimed at bank lenders and, and also company, small companies. Tells about the standard. One of the big issues we have, and I'm sure you have here in Saudi Arabia, is we've got, there are millions of companies around the world that are truly micro-sized. I mean, companies with from maybe no employees, just an owner, to five, maybe up to 10 employees, very small. Probably not a full-time bookkeeper, let alone an accountant, maybe audited, maybe not. And these little micro companies said to the IASB, even 230 pages is too much, more than we can handle. So we debated two ways to go, three. One is to do nothing. The second one is to have a third tier of standards. Say, OK, we've got full IFRS for publicly accountable. We've got the SME standard for the middle. And then we have something new for the micro. But we rejected that. We said, we don't need a third tier. The micro companies simply need a subset of what is in full IFRS, uh, in the IFRS for SMEs, of those issues that only relate to a little company of one to five or so employees. And so we published this little guidance book and actually, we designed it in a way that for a micro company, they'll never ha even have to look at the, full, at the SME standard. For most micros, everything they need to know is in this micro guidance book that I forget, it's 60 pages, I think. <clears throat> We're in the middle right now of a comprehensive review of the standard. We said when we issued it in July 2009 that after three years' experience, we will review the standard, see if any anything needs to be changed. And we're in the middle of that. We had uh, a public consultation, uh, and we issued an exposure draft of some a few changes. We've got comments back on those, and that's where the board stands at the moment. They hope to finish the final revisions by the end of this year to be effective next year. I'll tell you a little more about that at the end of this session. We have a whole section of our website dealing with SMEs. And you can see on this slide, number 30, all of the things that we have on our website. And this slide, 31 and 32, are the actual website links you can use to download if you want the training materials, there's the link. If you want the, uh, uh, the self-study ones, if you want the PowerPoint course materials, there it is, and so on. Lots of information, all for free, on our website. At this point, I want to very quickly go through the SME standard so you will get an idea of how it is simplified compared to full IFRS. These are not going to be complete summaries of the section. It can't be. I'm, I'm going to rush through it, as you'll see. But at least you'll get an idea of some of the important simplifications we've done for little companies. Section 1 defines what our board means by an SME. I've already explained 
we don't have quantified definition, but we've said it's a company without public accountability. That means you're not listed and you're not a bank. Section two has some fundamental concepts underlying the SME standard. Why is this section even needed? Because, remember, we've got a 230-page standard. We can't possibly cover in 230 pages all of the issues in full IFRS, 3,800 pages, let alone all of the potential issues out in the world. So now you're a little company, you've got an accounting question, you go through the standard and you do not find an answer to your question. What do you do? What we say in the SME standards, well, if you want, you can go look in full IFRS, but you're not required. What you are required to do is look in section two. Take a look at the basic concepts. For, let me give you a simple uh, example. One of the concepts is an asset should not be carried on the balance sheet for more than its estimated recoverable amount. That's a principle. So now you have spent some money, your little company, on something, and you go through the 230 pages, you look, what, what, kind, what did you spend your money on, and you try to decide, is it an asset that I can put on my balance sheet, or is it an expense? And you cannot find your particular kind of expenditure in the standard. Then you look at section two, which says, do you expect, is it probable that you will recover the cost? If it is not probable, it is not an asset. Write it off. So this is how section two can help when you cannot find the answer to your accounting question in the standard itself. Let me move on. Section three is very important. It's the basic principles for presenting financial statements. We say first that you can presume your financial statements present fairly financial position, results of operations, and cash flows if you follow this standard. You may assert compliance with the IFRS for SMEs only if you follow everything. You cannot pick and choose which principles you want to follow and then say, oh yes, I'm following the IFRS for SMEs if you did not follow some of the principles. We require one year of comparative financial statements, including the numbers in the footnotes. We have some exceptions in the standard for the footnote numbers, but basically you need two years of data. A complete set of financial statements includes a balance sheet, statement of financial position, and you can present results of operations in two ways. You can present a single statement of comprehensive income. I'll show you in the next slide what that means. Or you can present the old-fashioned income statement, bottom line, net profit or loss, and then a comprehensive income statement that has a few other items. Let's look at the next slide. Oops. Okay. On the left, the statement of comprehensive income starts with revenues minus your various expenses, a subtotal called profit or loss, plus or minus any other item, items of other comprehensive income, of which there are very few in the SME standard. In fact, only three. I'll, later, another slide, I'll show you what they are. And then you have total comprehensive income. So you have a single performance statement. That's one option. Or you can have two performance statements, two operating statements. One, and that's in the right column on this slide, a good old-fashioned income statement. So it has revenues, expenses, profit or loss, double underline. And then the separate 
statement of comprehensive income that begins with profit or loss and has the items of other comprehensive income and the total. So companies can choose that, but all of the information that they present is identical either way. This was sort of a political issue, and we've ended up uh, allowing the two alternatives because the information will be there either way. As you know, in full IFRS, there are many items of income or expense that are reported as other comprehensive income for lots of historical reasons. Some political, some technical. In the SME standard, we only have three items of OCI, and most SMEs will never have them. Number one, foreign exchange gains and losses. Well, most Many SMEs have no foreign exchange. They, they only do their operations in a single country. Changes in fair value of hedging instruments. Again, little companies, for the most part, don't do hedging. Uh, and they, or they don't do cash flow hedges where you'll have uh, the gains or losses in OCI. And actuarial gains and losses might be in other comprehensive income. They, if, they, if a small company has a defined benefit pension plan, but that will be rare. So these three kinds of other comprehensive income are rare. If an SME does not have that, I'm going to go back one slide now, then they only present the old-fashioned income statement. The bottom line is profit or loss. They have no OCI. They don't need to do anything more. A balance sheet is required. We do not require a, a current, non-current split. You can do that, or you can present your assets and liabilities simply in the sequence of liquidity. But we don't include in the SME standard mandatory requirements for the format of the statement or what you must label the line items. We have very minimal requirements for formatting. We have requirements for disclosure. Let me move on. Section. This, this is an issue. This, I'm on slide 44. If an SME presents consolidated financial statements, which some do, but uh, often they don't have subsidiaries, but if they did and they have consolidated financial statements and one of their subsidiaries has a minority interest, then the bottom line of profit or loss is before deducting minority interest. That's in the SME standard and that's also in full IFRS. And then you allocate the profit or loss, bottom line, between minority shareholders and parent company shareholders. That's a, a kind of a disclosure item. We require a statement of changes in equity separate from the operating statement, but SMEs can omit that if the only changes to equity are profit or loss and uh, there are no owner investments or withdrawals. Cash flow statement is required. SMEs may choose either the uh, indirect or the direct method of presenting cash flow from operations. Most companies use indirect. You start with net income or net profit or loss, add back or deduct non-cash items to come to cash provided by operations. The direct method, which is not used much, but we allow it, uh, you restate each item, each line on the income statement from an accrual basis to a cash basis. You get the same cash flow from operations. It's just a matter of presentation. We explain in section eight what should be in the notes to the financial statements. What, what, you have to disclose the basis for preparing the statements, namely IFRS for SMEs, summary of accounting policies, information about estimates and judgments, uh, and maybe some 
further information about line items on the face of the financial statements. And we have some guidance. Oh, and I should have mentioned, to a company, the IFRS for SMEs, we published illustrative financial statements. We don't have that for full IFRS. But for the SME standard, we have a complete set of illustrative financial statements with numbers, with footnotes, the numbers all tie across. So this is proved to be very helpful for little companies in setting up their own uh, simple financial statements. Section nine deals with consolidation. We require consolidation um, with a couple of small exceptions. The principle is control, the same with full IFRS. Section 10 deals with accounting policies. I won't repeat what I said earlier about uh, uh, section 10 is the one where the standard tells you what to do if you cannot find the answer to your accounting question directly in the standard. So that's, uh, that's part of this slide here. Tells you how to treat a change in accounting policy, a change in estimate, and a correction of an error. Section, probably the single most complicated area in accounting for any company, big or small, these days is financial instruments. And little companies are not an exception to that. However, most little companies only have basic financial instruments. They don't buy or sell uh, derivatives. They don't do the kind of hedging that might require hedge accounting. They don't buy exotic financial instruments. If they make an investment at all, it's a plain vanilla debt or equity security. So what we did in addressing financial instruments for SMEs is we split the topics into two chapters. Section 11 only deals with basic financial instruments. So the great majority of SMEs will only need Section 11. And I'm happy to tell you Section 11 is basically a historical cost model, except for investments in quoted equity. Only investments in quoted equity are at fair value. Section 12 deals with the exotic stuff, hedge accounting, derivatives, and investments in strange kind of securities, convertibles, that are part debt, part equity. But most SMEs will never have to look at Section 12. So Section 11 includes cash, bank deposits, commercial paper, accounts and notes receivable, accounts and notes payable, debt instruments that are plain vanilla and investments in equity that are plain vanilla, not exotic equity instruments. And the basis of accounting in all of these is amortized cost. The only exception, as I said, is if you buy a quoted equity and you can open the newspaper every day and see the value, then we say fair value through P&L. We don't have held to maturity. We don't have available for sale. We have very simple derecognition rules. Section 12 is the one that deals with the complex stuff. If you buy derivatives, if you do exotic kind of hedging, if you buy unusual financial instruments, then it's a fair value model. But for most SMEs, they'll never look at Section 12. Section 13 is inventories. Very simple. Inventories are at cost. You can do your cost by specific identification, FIFO, weighted average. And we have put all issues on impairment in one section, which is in uh, Section 26. So impairment of inventories, you look there in section 26, and it tells you when and how to write down uh, 
uh, if the today's fair value is below what you paid for your inventory. Something we've been doing in accounting for 100 years. Now, sections 14 and 15, I'll deal with together for two reasons. Section 14 deals with investments in associates. That is, you own between 20 and 50% of another company. Section 15 deals with joint ventures. You own exactly 50% of the other company. Those sections have the same requirements. And we have added a major simplification from full IFRS. Sections 14 and 15 say you can measure your investments in associates and joint ventures at cost. If you choose that method, then the dividends you receive, if any, are your income. And of course you have to consider impairment. You look for evidence that your investment is not worth today what you paid for it. And if it's not, you have to write it down. But it is not a fair value model. It is not like, you know, in uh, what the equity method is, which is really the investor picks up their share of the investee's profit and there's lots of adjustments. It's a very complicated requirement of uh, uh, IAS 20, uh, 28 for full, com full IFRS companies. You don't have to do it in SMEs. SMEs for investments in associates and joint ventures, carry it at cost, pick up the dividends you receive as income, really simple, and look for an indication of impairment. If you have none, no impairment to deal with. So I've now moved on to section 16 on investment property. This is where you invest in real estate, not to use it yourself, but as an investment to, to bring a return, income. Those of you who follow full IFRS, you'll know that IAS 40 says you have a choice of accounting models. It's purely a, a, an accounting policy choice. You can measure at fair value through P&L, your investment property, or you can use the cost depreciation model. What we say in the SME standard is if you know the fair value without undue cost or effort to get it, you must use fair value through P&L. But only then, only when you know it. If you don't know the fair value, you measure at cost with depreciation. A very simple model for investment property. Property, plant, and equipment is IAS 16, and that's another accounting policy choice. IAS 16 allows you to fair value through equity, through other comprehensive income. That option is not in the SME standard. SMEs told us, we, for most, mostly told us, we want to simply use a depreciation model. Very easy, something we've all been doing, again, for 100 years. The SME standard only allows the depreciation model for property, plant, and equipment. There are a few countries that have complained about this. They've said, we would like to measure at fair value through other comprehensive income because the ba banks want to know the fair value of their collateral. Well, what we've said is put it on the face of the balance sheet. Measure it at cost with depreciation and then say in parentheses fair value X or put it in the footnote. The fair value as determined by an appraisal is such and such. So the banks will have their information if you wish. But the basic principle is a simple one. Measure at depreciated cost. And there are other simplifications in our section on property, plant, and equipment as compared to what full IFRS requires. In section 18, on intangibles other than goodwill, we again took a very simple approach. None of it is capitalized write it off to expense. 
most little companies said that's fine with us. And what the IASB said is, if you, well, let me say in full IFRS, IAS 38 says you must start capitalizing research and development costs when you believe you have a commercially viable product from your research. The little company said, first of all, we don't know when we have a commercially viable product. We, we, we can't, we're not that sophisticated. S secondly, um, uh, they said, at the time we do know it, most of our research has already been charged to expense anyway in the past. What's the point of capitalizing the last little piece? Now, you could ask the same questions about full IFRS, but that's another story. We're, I'm only talking here about the SME standard. We made it simple, charge it to expense. We do not permit revaluation of any intangible assets in the SME standard. Full IFRS allows revaluation when there's a quoted market price. So milk quotas in Europe, taxi medallions in quite a few cities, stock exchange seats, those are intangibles that have quoted market prices. Full IFRS says you can mark those to fair value through OCI if you wish. SME standard says charge it to expense. If you purchased it, then you amortize it. But if you've uh, created the intangible yourself, charge it to expense. Now here was a huge change from full IFRS. That was a big debate in our board. Our board had just issued for full IFRS, IFRS 3 on business combinations. And they said, stop amortizing goodwill. Instead, every year, test it for impairment. Which means every year, the acquiring company must recalculate today's fair value of the goodwill that they bought last year or two years ago or five years ago, determine whether there's any impairment, and if there is, write it down. The little company said to us, we, can't, we don't know how to calculate today's value of goodwill. We don't have money to hire a professional to do that for us. The chances are we're going to ignore the impairment. We think it's more conservative to simply amortize over a short period of time. And our board agreed. And we say, amortize over the life, if known, if not, if you don't know, 10 years, a maximum of 10 years. Much simpler than full IFRS. Leases, our section is almost identical to full IFRS, but we have made a few simplifications. Uh, I, I won't bother talking about those, but I think you, for now, this section, 20, is the same as IAS 17. As you probably know, our board is in the middle of reconsidering IAS 17. Uh, they may make it more complicated for the full IFRS, but for the little companies, we're going to keep it simple. Section 21 deals with provisions. This is a liability of uncertain amount or timing. The little SME gives a warranty on its products. We don't know exactly how, how many customers will bring back the defective products. We don't know exactly what it will cost us to fix. But we have a history. What Section 21 says is you must accrue based on your best estimate. And we give guidance on how to measure. Another one, the little company is being sued. And the suit is in a court of law. Do we accrue a provision or not? We have guidance in this section on something like that as well. And we've got a, an appendix to Section 21 with a bunch of examples to help little companies apply that section. Section 22 of the standard is interesting in that it deals with some issues that full IFRS doesn't deal with. 
the first thing it does is it, it explains what is the difference between, how do we distinguish an instrument between liability and equity? And our principle is taken out of IAS 32, and that is if there is a possibility that the company will have to pay cash, then it's a liability. If the company can refuse to pay cash, then it's equity. So if your company has issued, um, a, let's say, a, con a, 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 a kind of share of stock that has a mandatory redemption feature, 10 years from now, the company must buy this share of stock back. Under full IFRS, well, I don't know what full IFRS, but we say, that's a liability. The company cannot avoid paying cash. What we do in Section 22 that's not in full IFRS, we have guidance on original issuance of shares, sales of options and rights, how to account for stock dividends, and stock splits. Simple stuff in Accounting 101 in most universities, but it's not in our full IFRS, but it is the kind of thing that little companies will encounter. Revenue recognition, we have the same principles that are currently in IAS 18. Basically, if you're selling goods, you recognize revenue when you transfer all of the risks and rewards relating to those goods. Usually that means delivery, but as we go on and explain in section 23, sometimes you've delivered, but you're still on the hook. That is, you made a promise that what you built will produce a certain quantity of output and you'll keep fixing it until, you do, until it does, uh, or you've made other promises. Let's say you've told the buyer well, if you can't sell it, we'll buy it back. Well, then you really haven't sold it. So we've got guidance on that kind of thing in, in this standard. If you're selling services, we say use the percentage of completion method. Section 24 deals with government grants, and let me say, if those of you who have read I, full IFRS will probably agree with me, one of our worst standards is IAS 20, because it says you can measure a grant any way you want. Even, let's say the government gives you land to build your factory, you can measure it at a nominal amount of one RIA, or one dollar. You know. So what does that tell the investor? It tells you nothing, but that's allowed in full IFRS. We said for the SME standard, little companies get grants. Let's measure this stuff right. And so what we've said, when you get a grant, measure the grant at the fair value of what you receive. That's one of the choices in full IFRS, but it's not required. You pick it up as income if you have fulfilled the conditions the government has imposed on you for getting the grant. If you have not yet fulfilled those conditions, it's a liability because you'll have to return it to the government if you don't fulfill the conditions. If you fulfill them over time, then you'll spread the income over time. It's a simple principle. It has, to my knowledge, we haven't had any questions or problems about this section since we issued the standard and I hope someday full IFRS will move in the same direction. Now this is one we've gotten some flack over, section 25. Section 25 deals with borrowing costs and what we say, simple accounting, charge it to expense. When we issued the SME standard, full IFRS gave companies a choice, charge it to expense or capitalize some borrowing cost if it relates to a self-constructed asset. They've since changed full IFRS to say you must, it's not a choice anymore, you must capitalize if it relates to a self-constructed asset. 
they changed full IFRS as part of the convergence with US GAAP. But if you read IAS uh, 23 on borrowing costs, you'll see how to calculate the amount that's eligible for capitalization and the asset base that's eligible is very complex. Especially if you have not borrowed money with a specific debt issue for a specific project, but you finance that project with your general borrowings. How do you allocate the cost of the borrowing to a particular project? It ain't easy. And what we did for SMEs, we said, don't bother, just charge it to expense. I said, we've got some uh, negative reaction to this. There are a few countries that would have said to us, we would like to capitalize. And that's one of the issues in our comprehensive review. So maybe the board will change, we'll see. Share-based payment, that's a fancy term for stock options. We thought, well, don't, we don't even need to address this for SMEs because most SMEs will not issue share-based payment. But actually, we learned that that's not true. They, many SMEs in many countries do issue payments in shares in some way. They may not be stock options, but it's still a share-based payment that has to be accounted for. So what we did, see, full IFRS says you must measure the fair value We're using an option pricing model, you know, like Black-Scholes model. This is very complicated for listed companies to measure, and they have to hire uh, compensation consultants, actuaries, etc. Little companies haven't got the money to hire the ex experts, and there aren't enough experts around the world to do it for these little companies. So what we said is, if you know the fair value of any share-based payment you've given, if you know it without undue cost or effort, measure it that way. If not, Section 26 says, here are three simplifications that you can do so that you can measure this in-house. Well, basically, what we say is the board of directors can estimate the value as best as they can. So it's, it's, a, it's a fair value model, but much simplified from a, an option pricing model that we require for the listed companies. I mentioned we put everything uh, uh, on impairment in a separate section, it's section number 27, with inventory right down to, uh, from uh, you measure selling price, less cost to complete and, and dispose, and you compare that with the carrying amount of your inventory, and if it's lower, write it down. For everything else, you must write it down to rec you, can, you must first look for an indicator of impairment for any of these. If there's no indication that your inventory is impaired, that your other assets are impaired, do nothing. If there's some indication, then measure recoverable amount, which is the greater of fair value, less uh, what we call value in use. And we have guidance on what, what that means. But the first thing you do under our, or I don't have it on a slide here, but you look for an indicator of impairment, which means the asset that you, you're not using it anymore, or it's not performing the way you had expected. <coughs> Most assets for little companies are performing fine. They're still using them. There's no indication of impairment. You have to do no calculations at all. Full IFRS still requires calculations. Oops. 28 on employee benefits, we did find that in some countries, every SME is required to issue defied, defined benefit obligations. There's countries, for example, that say after five years or 10 years of working for a company, the employee is entitled to some minimum payment. The company hasn't set up a pension program, the law has set it up for them. 
uh, and that's, there's quite a few countries that do that. So we had felt we had to deal with it. At the same time, we said, we can't tell these little companies. They got to do an actuarial calculation using um, what, what is called the projected unit credit method as required in IAS 19. They can't handle it. So what we did in our section 28 is we put in simplified calculations that a company can do in-house. Income tax, I want, I want to go through these last couple of sections very quickly because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, income tax, we do recognize deferred taxes. This was the last section we completed, our board completed on the whole standard. Our board were divided as to whether SMEs should recognize deferred tax, and if so, how to calculate it. In the end, we've said you must recognize and you calculate the same basic principles in full IFRS. Um, and and that's, that's the way it is. Foreign currency translation, we have the same principles as in uh, uh, full IFRS, IAS 21, uh, which is a functional currency approach. Your company must decide what is your functional currency. Where I live in Hong Kong, we've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of SMEs who do most of their business in mainland China. So all of their revenue comes in in renminbi, all, and the factories are up in China, and uh, the expenses are paid in renminbi, but it's a Hong Kong company and the financial statements are in Hong Kong dollars. So their functional currency is renminbi, what we say is for these little companies, you keep your books in renminbi, and then we have guidance on how to convert from your functional currency into your presentation currency. Hyperinflation, this only affects very few countries, but we've said if your inflation rate is more than 100% over three years, you must prepare general price level adjusted financial statements, and we have guidance on how to do that. Section 32 deals with post balance sheet events. We have the same two types that you are in full IFRS. If, it, if the post balance sheet event gives you more information about a situation that existed at year end, you do recognize it. So you had a receivable, an account receivable, your SME, uh, somebody owed you money, you weren't sure if you would get paid or not, but uh, the second week of the year after your year end, that company goes bankrupt. Well, now you're very sure they're not gonna get paid. And they didn't go bankrupt in two weeks. They were bankrupt or close to it at December 31st. You should recognize the write down in the old year. On the other hand, if you have a fire in a factory in January for a December year end, that is not a situation that existed in December. You do not write it down. We have a lot of guidance on related party disclosures in section 33. That's important for little companies, probably more than for listed companies, because the little company is managed by one owner and there are opportunities for transactions with the owner that may not be at arm's length. So we don't, we don't say you must impute a market price for transactions that you've entered into, but you must disclose the terms of those transactions. The only thing I'll point out in section 34 is agriculture. Full IFRS requires fair value for all agricultural assets crops, livestock, timber, palm oil, etc. The SME standard says you use fair value only when you know it without undue cost or effort. If you don't know the fair value, then you use a cost depreciation model. That seems to have worked quite well. Finally, section, our last section 35 uh, deals with first time adoption. What we say is two important things. First, you must go back and restate one prior year. So if you're a little company and you adopt the SME standard the first time in 2014, you must also prepare 2013 financial statements using the SME standard. But the second important thing we say is 
here's a whole list of exceptions that you do not have to go back and restate because we know it's complicated for this list. So you're permitted to go back and restate, but not required. I think I would like to end here. The, the last few, except I want to get to my big conclusion, but the last few slides talk about the comprehensive review. I want to skip those. Uh, you can read about it. It's going on now, and, and, and this section talks about the proposed amendments. But I want to just finish up on my slide number 93, uh, headed in conclusion. I believe that the IFRS has already resulted in better quality financial reporting for literally millions of SMEs. It's a standard that was designed for their capabilities. We recognize that SMEs don't have money to hire outside experts. They don't have a lot of in-house accounting expertise. We designed a standard for them. It is aimed at lenders and creditors, not equity investors who are uh, worried about long-term uh, earnings and growth and uh, share price. It makes little company financial statements understandable and comparable across borders. I think if, if capital providers, I mean, the lenders and creditors, understand the numbers that a little company produces and they have confidence in those numbers, the little company will be in a better position to obtain capital at a fair price. And in the end, the, the national economy in which those little companies operate improves because capital is going to the good companies. So I think it's a win-win situation uh, we've got 80-something countries already have adopted, and many of these countries have millions of SMEs. Brazil has got 5 million using the standard. I hope Saudi Arabia will, in the next few years, consider it and maybe permit or require some or all of your SMEs to use it. Uh, I thank you very much for your, your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, it was mentioned at the beginning that uh, the uh, IFRS for SME can be used by uh, companies whose securities are not uh, publicly traded and who, which is not a financial institution. Does this mean, uh, first of all, that uh, if there are two companies with exactly the same capital, who are exactly doing the same thing, having the same investments, the same operation, but just because one of them is publicly traded and the other one is not, that one of them can use the SME standard and the other one cannot. And my other question is about mutual funds. Mutual funds, they're being used and uh, the financial statements of mutual funds are being relied on by big sector of the public, but it's not a financial institution. It's the, the, the shares, there are no shares to be uh, traded yes. there. Uh, two good questions. Let me first tell you that when the IASB issues a standard, there's a staff working on the project, and the staff prepare papers, and the staff prepare recommendations. And once in a while, the board rejects the staff recommendation. I tell you that because the staff recommendation was that each juris the board should let each country decide whether small listed companies or mutual funds or small banks or credit, small credit unions, let each country decide which standards should be used. That was the staff recommendation. And I was the one and only staff on the project, so that was my recommendation. The board rejected it. Now let me tell you, and it relates both to your first part of your question, which is you have two identical companies, one happens to be listed and one is not. And it relates to the second part about mutual funds. <clears throat> I was a little loose in my language when I said financial institutions. What the standard actually says is any institution that takes money 
from a broad group of outsiders. So a mutual fund would fit that definition. An insurance company would fit that definition. So the answer to your second question is mutual funds are not eligible. On the first question, why would two absolutely identical companies use two different sets of standards? Our board would say they're not identical. The company that has listed, even if it's small, has taken on a special obligation. They're taking money from outsiders who have no power to control the company. I buy 100 shares of a listed company. I take the information that I get. I can't you know, call, uh, telephone Renault and say, well, I bought 100 shares of your company. I want this and this and this. So the board said, we designed full IFRS to provide information to people in public capital markets who cannot demand the information they want for themselves. For the little companies, we designed it mainly for the bank lenders and, and, and creditors. We said there's a different audience. The companies are not really identical. But again, I must tell you, I'm in the minority, I think, when I say I would let the jurisdiction decide. I would, go for, I would say the same for small listed companies. Um, that's based on what I think is just their capability. Look, I went to El Salvador. I went to Trinidad. You know, Trinidad have a stock exchange. They got two listed companies with more than 100 employees. El Salvador has only got 20 listed companies total. I don't know if any of them have more than 100 employees. I was just Yemen. I just finished writing a profile for Yemen. Uh, they, I think it was Yemen, where they, they, they don't have a stock exchange, but companies are selling shares to the public uh, without a stock exchange. It's very loosely reg re regulated. Uh, I, I think the quality of reporting by those kind of companies is going to be pretty poor. And if you tell them they've got to use 4,000 pages of full IFRS, I think you're not going to get as good a set of financial statements as if you say, well, you're permitted or the, your, your regulator or your government can decide it's in the public interest for them to use SME standards. I went twice. It was like going into the lion's den. I went twice and spoke at the National Congress of Credit Unions. And they said to me that we have thousands of credit unions all over the world with 75 or fewer customers, depositors, not employees, depositors. And we have one high school trained part-time bookkeeper. You're telling us we have to know 4,000 pages of standards, we can't handle it. So I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a different view than our board is, but I don't, I, you know, it's not my decision. So that's where it is. I've told you the answer the way it, it is. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm Nawaf Al-Thriyan. First, uh, I appreciate your uh, efforts for presenting this seminar. And you are more than welcome here in Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Uh, second, my question is a bit a theoretical one. And uh, uh, in the full set of the IFRS for the public companies, Generally, there are main goal is to uh, fairly present and measure uh, the financial position and the result of the operation. What is the main view for the SME uh, when the standards was, was set? Thank you very much. It's a good question. And my answer is a very quick answer. It's the same goal. Now, we had, in developing the SME standard, there were people who argued the audience is different. The audience for small companies is the tax authority or maybe the owners themselves. There's one owner or two owners of the company and the financial statements should serve the tax authority or the owner. Not the same as, as, as you suggested, you know, presenting financial position and results of operations to ex outside investors. Our board did not agree with that. We said, first of all, for the tax authority, our standards cannot possibly measure taxable income in 
80 countries around the world. That's tax law. What we can do is provide a balance sheet measuring um, uh, the company's assets and liabilities, income statement measuring revenue and expense for an investor with a bottom line on the income statement. And then if you want to have adjustments from the bottom line to meet the needs of the tax authority, that's additional and easy to get information. Likewise, for the owners. The owner can demand whatever information they want. If the owner wants to go out, is trying to decide, should I buy insurance on my various properties? The owner may say, I need to know a replacement cost for all of my properties. But accounting can't provide that. So what, what we say, for, and it's the identical for the SME standard and full IFRS, we want to present financial position, results of operations in financial statements that are aimed at external users, investors, lenders, and creditors. So I think the, it's identical to your theoretical question. We get the same answer in full IFRS as we do for uh, the SME standard. Thank you very much. Yeah, Asif, Asif. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm Asif Iqbal from Sokpa. Uh, is ISB considering a third set of financial statements for level three, smallest of the small entities, like micro entities? The, the, my short answer, Asif, is no. The IASB did talk about it. Um, in the, when we issued the IFRS for SMEs, we also issued a little booklet called Basis for Conclusions. And in the Basis for Conclusions, the board explains why they got every answer they did in the SME standard and why they rejected certain answers. And in that pub published Basis for Conclusions, they talk about a third level. And at that time, that was in July 2009, the board said, absolutely, there's no need for a third level and explained why. But we have in, we backed down a little on that since then. We have issued the 60-page guidance book for micro-entities. What we did in that book, and, and you can download that from our website. We actually have never printed it because it's just as easy to download. It is everything a little micro company, this third level of company would need. But it is the principles from full IFRS. It has 35 sections. Most of them are four para three or four paragraphs. At the beginning of the section, it says, we did not cover the following six topics that are in section 22 in the SME standard. If you've got any of these kind of transactions, you will have to look there. But we only left out things that we said most micros will never have. So my answer to your question is that while we are not, the board is not inclined to issue a third level of standards, in a sense we've already done that. We have issued this micro guidance book, 60 pages. Ta please take a look at it. I think you will find that for little companies from one to 10 employees, it is all they will need. Maybe they'll have an occasional kind of transaction where they'll need to look in the IFRS for SMEs, but all of those omitted topics are listed right in a box at the front of each section in this micro standard. So I think we've got an elegant way of dealing with this third tier without actually having a third tier. I can tell you that there are countries in the world and small countries that have four tiers of gap. You look at the, the United Kingdom. For listed companies, they've got IFRS as adopted by the EU. They have now taken the IFRS for SMEs and made it their middle tier. And then they've got what they call Frizzy, financial reporting standard for smaller entities for the bottom tier. Each group can trade up. So if you're eligible to use Frizzy, you can still use the SME standard or you can still use full IFRS. 
they've got three. Germany has four, Denmark has four, and so on. I, I think it, we didn't need it in IFRS the way we've done it. I think we've done it better. <laughs> Sir, if, if I need to go to a headphone, I'm happy to do that. If you want to ask in Arabic, I'm sorry, I forgot there's no headphone. Yeah, you've mentioned something about the intangible assets and how, in your opinion, or your own standard, that could be, just had to be written off as an expense. My question that may not make some of the company owners happy. That's possible. My question is, would the owners had the selection or the alternatives to use some of the SMS, or they have to have full adaption to have to, say, to comply with consistency. That's my Thank you. I went to work for the US FASB in 1973. So I've been working in accounting standards a long time. One thing I absolutely know is we will never be able to make everybody happy. Um, because some owners will like this uh, principle, but others will like that principle. At the same time, I also know that if we want to achieve our goal, which is comparable financial numbers across borders, we have to make decisions. And in doing that, we are going to make some company owners unhappy. Another thing I know is we have to protect our good name. We cannot simply say, well, here's our book, but you can go ahead and change it, but you can still say you're following IFRS or you're, still, you're following the IFRS for SMEs. So my short answer to your question is a company cannot change our standard and still assert that they comply with our standard. But that doesn't mean we, they cannot try to tell their story in addition to telling it with our standard. For, for example, uh, the issue of property revaluation that I mentioned earlier. We found that there are a few countries where they really want to do this. So what we've said, uh, anybody who asks, is put on the face of the balance sheet or put in a footnote the fair value of your property, your real estate, or whatever you want to, to, to tell the reader of your financial statements is the fair value. But if you're going to put that number in place of the depreciated cost number, then you're not following IFRS. And as I mentioned in, in section three of our SME standard, we are very clear that you can assert compliance with the IFRS for SMEs only if you comply with all of it. You cannot pick and choose because if your company picks and chooses this item and the next company picks and chooses this item and you know already you've got three or four different possible permutations and then when you've got millions of companies there will be just no comparability at all. So this may not be the answer you wanted to hear but that's, that's, this is the reality. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.